It's funny. So on that beach, when Stephen and I met in Thailand, we had gone yeah. there for the full moon party. We didn't know each uh, other. Okay, uh, okay. A mutual friend of ours, Raj, had, had brought a bunch of people together. And uh, that was the first time I had mushrooms. Stephen walked me up to this uh, place called the Shroom Shack. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and, um, and we came down with these chocolate shakes. And they just tasted like chocolate shakes. And, and he then, didn't tell you. He didn't tell he didn't you. Tell he was me. like, here's and, a chocolate shake. And we had the most magical evening. The entire group, there was like eight of us. We were on the beach and, you know, laughing and playing and, and of course, realized that there was something in the shakes. <laughs> Welcome to Anything and Everything. I'm your host, Angelo Esposito, bringing you compelling chronicles of entrepreneurship, where success means doing anything and everything. Welcome to another episode of Anything and Everything, where we talk to entrepreneurs about how they are willing to do anything and everything to make their ventures work. I'm here today with Sanjay Single, who has a really interesting sort of entrepreneur, investor, probably like 10 more things you could add that title, writer. Writer is another good one. I'll let him do, do a proper intro. Um, I met Sanjay just as a quick background. Uh, when we were in tech stars in Toronto many, many years ago and full disclosure, he ended up investing in, uh, whisk, which is our tech company where we help restaurants get back there, you know, buy back their time. But all this to say, Sanjay is a super interesting guy. And I think we got a, a few interesting topics we want to talk about today. So Sanjay, without further ado, welcome to the show. Angelo, thanks for having me. I love sounding off and rambling with my weird opinions uh, and so thanks for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> of course, a hundred percent. You know, just for context, like uh, to go a bit deeper, we actually met uh, Techstars and I remember it was Techstars Toronto. It was the first cohort in Canada, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, I, and I believe, you know, Sunil or, or whoever wasn't, you know, did, decided to have you as a speaker and you shared your story on one of the nights, you know, during our Techstars program, uh, basically about your, your, one of your ventures at the time, which was correct me I'm wrong, audiobooks.com, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And hearing your story, I was like, this guy is cool. So I'd love to chat a bit about that, but this guy's cool. I got to get to know him. Um, originally, I didn't even think you'd be an investor. I really just thought like, I want to be around this guy. He's super cool, super smart. And he's, <laughs> he's made mistakes and he's, he's like, he's lived. So I got to talk with this guy. And, and anyways, long story short, that's, that's where kind of things took off. Fast forward, you ended up investing since then. Obviously, I've been kind of following you, reading about some of your articles on on Medium, and I'm like, man, Sanjay's got a lot of interesting stuff, which ideally, we're gonna get through some of that today. So without, you know, rambling too much, I'd love to maybe start with that audiobooks part, just because that's how I met you. So can you just share maybe a piece of like, you know, what is audiobooks.com? And like at the time, like just, just maybe a little snippet of that story. Sure. Um, well, I started the company back in 2003, uh, and within a couple of months of when Facebook was started, actually, wow. and uh, always measured myself against Facebook's progress, which has led to, you know, this feeling of crushing disappointment um, <laughs> over the last 20 years. No, actually, the company started out, we started out in Canada. Uh, I was just an investor. In fact, I wrote an angel check into that company of, you know, $50,000 uh, less than what I invested in Whisk. And... Um, what happened was gradually over time, as it needed more money, I put in more money. A couple of year, a couple of years in, um, I realized that that the company looked like it'd be fun to join, and I actually joined as a customer service rep. So I was wow. actually answering the phone, saying, "Hey, my name's Bob." Literally, I was Bob. <laughs> and when Bob had to get his manager, he would go grab, you know, like Chris, and then I would be Chris. <laughs> and, um, and the company was probably was flirting with just crashing and burning, but. Google AdWords came out around that time, I think around oh, the fall of 03, and, uh, and that saved us. You know, Google AdWords, what it did is it created the ability to have virtual communities of people spread across the United States or Canada, but who were united through their search traffic, right. and an online retailer could then, you know, have a product that, you know, you could never have a physical retailer be really successful with audiobooks. The, the, only 2% of the public really listens to them a lot. More now, I think, with, with right. the popularity of podcasts. Podcasts right. have brought listening to stuff in your car really uh, home. And yeah, so then, I mean, it was a struggle. There were so many ups and downs with that business, including at one point, um, I got fired uh, by my own board. I, by that point, I think I was the chief marketing officer. Oh, wow. And uh, I was fired. 
a year later, I actually came back and bought out the whole company. Um, <laughs> and so that was, that was a sweet, sweet moment. And then as, <laughs> shortly after that, about a couple of years after that is when we really took off in our growth and the rest, I guess is, is history. <laughs> That's awesome. How was that feeling like of, of, you know, being fired and then, um, and then coming back, you know, being able to be like, you know, it's very, it's very, uh, Ari Gold almost of, of uh, feels very. Yeah, uh, well, you know what's interesting is is you know my recollection of it, of course, is skewed now. But the but I I went through, so I wrote a book called Zero to Tesla. Zero to Tesla, yeah. yeah. It was um, a moderately mildly fictionalized autobiography, and um, as I did the research for it, I actually went through all the events leading up to that firing and then uh, buying the company back. And I realized that the sequence of events, in the moment, everything's quite emotional. And when I look back on it, it was like, you know, things in thing people weren't as evil as I thought they were. People weren't mm. as noble as they as they maybe appeared to me at the time. But um, the reason it worked out is I was so angry when I got fired, but I, I was able to get over it. And because I was over it, a year later, all the emotions were taken out. So when I came back and said, hey, you know, no hard feelings. You know, all that just happened. I think it makes sense with the new stuff that I'm doing to acquire audiobooks. You know, this isn't this isn't about revenge or anything like that. I'll make you a good offer, and uh, and it worked. If I was if I was acquiring it out of like revenge or anger, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have worked. But, That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. And look and looking back, how, how how do you think you got over that? Because it's not easy, right? In, the, in 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 life in general, but obviously in the entrepreneurship journey, things get pretty emotional. Um, was writing the book a big part of that? Zero, writing Zero Tesla? No, part no, of the, it? The, no. I, I wrote the book after the company. Oh, was, that was after. Was wildly that. successful. Yeah. Okay. And, and I didn't publish it until the company had been sold, and and I was kind of on my way. Um, okay. Got financially, it. but uh, no, you know, it's. Have you ever been sued, Angelo? Uh, I mean, company has been threatened, uh, but not officially sued. Just little uh, letters to try to. You know, okay, but have you ever been work. in a, a position where you had to decide whether you wanted to litigate or just settle? No, fortunately, no. Okay, okay. So many people, once you've been in business long enough, guaranteed yeah. it's going to happen. I work right. in hospitality now where I own a couple of bars. Shit happens all the time. Our staff get into altercations. There's, uh, you know, I won't get into the details unless right, you push right. me on it. But <laughs> um, sometimes you can be really angry with somebody and know that they did all the wrong things and it's still better to settle than it right. is to keep on fighting and right. and this was with audiobooks was perhaps one of the, the first times where it was just better better to settle than mm. to keep on fighting and that emotional i don't know i don't know what you'd call it that the emotional turmoil and settling it down by realizing look i'm 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 my pride will get this um this uh i don't know encouragement uh and positive feedback from fighting but long term I'll be much, much happier if I just walk away and forget about this. Right. And that's it. And what, the thing is, once you walk away and stop thinking about it and talking about it uh, all day, every day, you do start thinking about other things. And right. that's it. It's just no. but you have to accept the intellectual decision. Walk away. Just. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, not, when, as soon as you said that, my thought that came to mind was uh, my dad, entrepreneur's whole life, 50 years in the business, grocery business. Long story short family issues, whatever, lawsuits, this and that, like, just like horrible, like just really mean, like you can write a book on it, like really bad. But we were all like, as his kids, like, come on down, take them to court. You got all the, you know, and like, he had the wisdom looking back. I'm like, shit, you definitely are wise. Cause he was like, he knew it would take years. He knew it would take big money. He knew it wasn't worth like, you know, he did the math. He's like, I'm in my mid at the time in my mid sixties, I'm going to what spend six years in court. I'm going to be in my 70s. Like, and it's funny you mentioned because it's so relatable and it's I think there is wisdom there and like sometimes, you know, put pride aside and, and you realize that it's probably better for your <laughs> for your soul long term, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact I should probably I should probably do a post on this, but one of the members of that board that fired me actually gave me advice while I was still, you know, a member of the company. And he said, uh, we we were being sued for something or another, it was twelve thousand dollars, I think. And he said, Sanjay, any problem that can be settled uh, for less than $20,000 isn't a problem. Mm. It's just a check you have to write. And I have used that. I think the price is probably up to $40,000 now. <laughs> but, with inflation, um, yeah. Yeah, but it's, I've used that many, many times. 
um, especially in, in legal cases where it's like, you know, if I can just have you out of my life for $20,000, uh, that is easily worth it. And it, mm -hmm. it has always been worth it. That's awesome. That's cool. And then, and then out of curiosity, I don't know what you can disclose, but you know, um, audiobooks, what did that exit look like? Just to kind of, you know, move on, but I'd love to hear, right. You've built this thing up, you come back, you buy, and then you mention an exit. What did that look like? And how, you know, a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs listening, you know, they, they either dream of building it real big or the hopes of one day, you know, selling it and being acquired. So I'd love to maybe touch on that. If so, you, can. you know, what's, what's funny is, um, a lot of exits happen in the range of, I don't call it 20 to a hundred million. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and those are all good, great outcomes. Right. And what, what really determines how well you do, uh, at the end of that is whether you own the entire company, how many people do you have to share that with Correct. and, uh, your tax situation and right. the company we had had, we had great accountants and we had set this thing up from the get go that if it ever got acquired, uh, it would be very tax advantageous for us. Yes. Uh, we, we used a particular strategy that was is impossible, for example, in the United States and uh, that, that involved a part of the company being located offshore. But that okay. and even that particular strategy isn't available in Canada anymore. But it resulted I owned 100 percent of the company at the time we sold wow. and I didn't pay any tax on the sale. Um, wow. So and I also That's awesome. they gave me the opportunity to um, sell all of it at the time for cash or to take a third of the sale and roll it into the new, the acquiring entity. Interesting. Which is another strategic player in audiobooks. And I really believed in audiobooks and their, in their ability to leverage the company. So I said, fine, I'll take the two thirds cash. They wanted me to take it all in cash. And I said, no, I want two thirds cash. I want oh, a third wow. of the acquiring company. That acquiring company tripled in value over the course of the wow. next two years. Smart and wow. so the net to me ended up being I don't know, like 70 or 80% higher than, than what I already thought was a great offer. Um, that's amazing. So yeah, you know, that's super cool. Yeah. Uh, Scott that, Galloway talks about champagne and cocaine as the, uh, as the metaphor, let's call it a metaphor. Okay. Yeah. For yeah. what success looks like. There were private jets and champagne and cocaine. Uh, <laughs> we got sold. That's amazing. And I need to ask you, okay, life. Cause you know, I, I've had the, the, the fortune to, to at least, be around people like yourselves who have, you know, had good exits and, and they all tell me like life post exit. I'd love to hear from you. You know, you get a big lump sum of money. It doesn't matter how much it is. We get a big lump sum of money. How much does it really change your life? Like what, what do you notice like really change in your life? You know, day one, day two, like I said, maybe some partying, whatever, but like how, how did it affect your life? Let's say, and I'd love to share that with the audience. Cause people always imagine like, Oh, once I get there, there's this new goal, but like, I'd love to hear from you. Like who lived it. So, it's interesting. One part of that transition didn't happen, which is that the company was already quite successful, cash flow positive. I, I was drawing a lot of money out of it at the time we sold. So that moment actually happened probably five years before the sale. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Suddenly, you know, being able to buy anything. I had this one moment. Um, I remember it was like 2009. My son had just been born and I went into uh, uh, Best Buy and yeah. Angel, I could buy anything. I could buy, I could buy like a dozen PlayStation games if I wanted to. Right? I could buy anything. I must have spent, I probably spent a few thousand dollars. I bought a new monitor and a whole bunch of cables and some PlayStation. I mean, I, I bought a bunch of shit and realized awesome. that I could have anything I wanted. And, um, uh, and I actually lost interest in it. I think so much of the fun of shopping is window shopping and saying, mm -hmm. I would like that. The wanting is its own kind of reward. And knowing I could have it, I don't, okay, this, I, I'm not looking for sympathy here, okay? But it was like, I actually lost something by being able to have anything in that store. Um, and I stopped going there casually to just kind of browse. Uh, right. Then when I actually sold the company and suddenly had, because it, it was an all cash offer and I didn't have to stay with the company. So I suddenly, I suddenly found myself out with, well, I became a venture capitalist, right? Um, I started up the 500 Startups Canada Fund, uh, which has had tremendous financial success. But, you know, the uh, venture capital just didn't sit well with me. I didn't enjoy managing other people's money. Mm. And, you know, I've spoken many times with the folks at Mantella and with the folks at Techstars. And right. they don't like this stuff, right? Um, Robin and Duncan, they, they love 
uh, startups and working with them. I like talking yes. with you as a peer, but right. I, I, it, I, I find it a little more draining um, talking to investors, right? Investors mm. are a pain in the ass. We are, as a class <laughs> of people, uh, uh, not a lot of fun to be around. But um, so, so really selling the company resulted in me having all this capital and not being really sure what to do with it, right? So I started a venture capital fund that lasted a couple of years. I opened a bar, which has been awesome. Everybody, please come visit my bar, Coffee Oyster Champagne on King West. Um, and so that, that's that been the best thing I've done. And, you know, I tried to make a documentary. I got into philanthropy. I gave away a, uh, a shit ton of money for mental uh, mental health research using psychedelics. Wow. And, yeah, I definitely want to get into that after. Yeah. And so I've just, it's just been, you know... I miss having a set of daily metrics that I could look at and say, you are successful if you got more than X number of new customers today. It was nice and simple. It was simple. Right. Now it's harder, you know? Now it's harder. That's interesting. Because, yeah, the, 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 the few founders I've talked to who have had, you know, successful exits, I noticed a small pattern. Maybe this it's a small sample size, but they all said, similar to your Best Buy story, they said, they didn't look at the menu as much as closely, let's say, when they went to a restaurant. They weren't as worried about like this wine or that wine, right? Like where you might be before you have your money. Uh, but they said, or you know, and you might buy a Tesla, you might buy a house, like sure, like little bit. But they said, apart from the, that initial kind of, I want to buy this, I want to buy that, and then not worrying when you go out as much, they said the life was pretty much the same, which was interesting because I think the average person might think, oh, all my problems will be solved once I have money. And of course, money can help. But I think the takeaway I got from all these founders was like, everything was still the same, whether it was marriage problems. The only thing that changed was like, yeah, I go out, I don't worry as much about the price tag. Yeah, and, and that's not nothing, right? So yeah, not yeah, something. Money, but but I'll, I'll add to that. It's like, um, the, it's not like the financial stress goes away. It's just you're worrying about different things. Now it's yes. like, I never used to worry about the NASDAQ. <laughs> right? or, or inflation numbers and now everything um gets affected by that so right so you just have to learn some level of equanimity i got into meditation that's helped uh a lot but every person i know who's who's had a successful exit or who's made a lot of money professionally yeah their problems are always centered around relationships mm. uh you know it starts with your your own partner your kids your parents your friends if you're if you learn how to manage those well then it actually it really doesn't matter if you've got a lot of money or a little money or you know mm. it's it's focused on the relationships that makes sense i love that and and then i know that and correct me if i'm wrong here but i believe you co-founded six uh companies and according to my research three of them were pretty successful and again call me out if i'm wrong here um i'd love to like i find one of the best way to learn is like also just through failures so like i mm -hmm. love if you don't mind. I know you shared a few on, on, on written format, but I'd love to maybe share some of failures and lessons learned um, with some of these ventures. Sure. So here's my biggest lesson learned from the failures. And there there have been a lot of them. And it, sometimes I forget just how many because <laughs> you disappear, right? The success yeah. stay with you uh, longer. Um, and what happens is with every venture, every venture, there comes a point where you're up against a wall. And, uh, and you don't know if you're going to make it. I remember with one of my businesses, it was an online search engine business. Um, PayPal froze our accounts. They thought that we were doing something shady. And uh, we had to get into a conversation, our lawyers with their lawyers, and said everything's clear. But for a while, we were just, our, our funds were completely frozen. And it's in those moments where you, where you either you man up and you solve the problem or you roll over. And... Uh, I am not one to say never quit. Like I absolutely, quit. you know, anytime I've quit, it's always been the right call. I've never regretted quitting, which mm -hmm. probably means I've hung on a little bit too long. Right. I, I never regretted it. Right. Um, but a lot of times, if you're not fully committed to something, then you'll never get over that wall moment. And uh, I see this all the time with people who start businesses later in their life once they're already financially successful, including myself, Right. It's that now if I start a business and I hit that wall, it's like, yeah, you know, this, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm too old for this shit. Um, <laughs> I'll just move on to the next thing. And there right. really isn't a next thing that just smoothly takes off. Um, right. You know, our, our, the most successful thing I've done since selling my company has been uh, Coffee Oyster Champagne, the bar. It's Beautiful had, bar, by the way. Beautiful thank you. Bar. Thank you. Um, it, it if it didn't if I didn't have a younger business partner, Stephen Dacos, who was 
uh, skilled and also experienced in the industry. If he wasn't around, then we probably we wouldn't have made it past some of the walls of getting permits, mm. of initially, you know, not being able to hire staff. COVID would have shut oh, us down for sure, yeah. COVID, right? Yeah. But um, uh, together we made it through. Uh, there, there's the value of having uh, right. a good good co-founders uh, as well, the right partner. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's funny the, the I think Hormozzi said this, but I mean. It, but like the idea of, you know, the grass being greener on their side when it comes to solving problems, you know, you're like, oh, this other bit, the other business always looks simpler. Like, oh, that makes so much sense. They don't have inventory. Like you're thinking yeah. about like all the things and it always looks greener, but like there's always going to be problems in your industry. And someone's looking at another business thinking like, oh, that one looks so nice and easy. And, and, and yeah, it's funny when you think about it. And, and, and talking about, you know, the, the, the bar side, obviously, like that was a really cool kind of synergy, I think, between us because when we met and, you know, I kind of pitched like, Hey, like, would you be open investing in West? This is what we do. We're helping restaurants save time by, you know, helping with their back of house. Big part of that being, you know, inventory and recipe costing. And you were kind enough to get us into that, into your bar, which was super cool. Cause you guys have a substantial amount of inventory. So it was also a nice test for whisk because it was a good amount of champagne and wines and and spirits and um and yes yeah, so I'd, I'd love to just hear you know just to, to change pace real quick to hear more about where was the inspiration behind you know opening a bar like what made you want to go from hey i'm successful i'm doing my thing like i want to now open a bar all right so this is very specific what happened um it was around the time we were shutting down um uh well, actually, we didn't shut down the Venture Capital Fund. 500 Startups Canada still exists. It still has about 35 investments. It's doing really well. Um, uh, we, but when it, when it was clear that the fund wasn't going to continue and most of the partners were going to move on and do something else, yeah. uh, my assistant at the time, Miriam, was in the theater uh, space. And she was doing producing activities for, for people who were making small independent films. And I had just been to see this play called Sleep No More in New York City. And a number of people here listening to this may have, may have uh, seen the play if they knew. It, it's just magnificent. It takes place in this warehouse of 50 rooms and it's totally immersive. You go in and you wear a mask and you're not allowed to talk and you just wander around and actors appear around you and act out scenes in mime and then they disappear oh, wow. into another room and you chase them into another room and you can see the next scene. And so wow. all these scenes are happening in parallel. You know, one of the rooms is like a, the check-in desk of a hotel. Another room is a psych ward of a hospital. Another room oh is God. a little girl's bedroom. Another room is a candy store. Um, and it's this beautiful thing that happens. And, and I thought, wow, you know, as my next thing, I had nothing going on. My yeah. next thing, I've got some money. I've got time in my hands. I would love to bring a play like that to uh, Toronto. Oh, wow. Okay. But I am completely unequipped, you know, to do something like that. Miriam was encouraging me. See, she, she said, ah, that would be so much fun if we could do something like that. But eventually, uh, so the very first room you end up in before you enter the, the, the rest of the play is a really vampy 1940s bar with a lot of red velvet and people walking around and go, hello, may, how may I help you? Um, and I love that bar. Uh, but they serve, serve shitty drinks and, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, I thought, so I said, well, what about if we just bring the bar? Can we just bring the bar from um, from see no, uh, uh, from Sleep the no play more. Sleep yeah. No More? Yeah, and uh, and we thought, oh, that, that sounds a great idea. Now um, the problem then is I know nothing about restaurants either, <laughs> but so I had this idea in my head of doing it, and then uh, six months later I met Stephen on a beach in Thailand. Uh, oh wow! Friends. Okay, we we're on vacation together. And as we got to know each other better, I found out his restaurant background and said, you know, we, we, sh we should open this bar together. And uh, uh, he said, you know, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard of. He was out of restaurants at that point. He said, I hate, you know, like it's one of those industries, like every industry, as you said, every industry has its problems. Every yeah. industry has its specific problems. In restaurants, it's really the staffing because um, it's, tough, it's such yeah. a, uh, a revolving door. Yes. Yeah. And he didn't want to get back into that. I said, look, we'll, we'll hire people. We'll figure a way around. It took me six months to convince him. Um, you'd have to ask him. I'm not sure if he's happy or sad about that now. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's been a wild ride. And, and so, then, so then a few other things came into, you know, the movie Midnight in Paris with Owen Wilson and Rachel McAdams. Uh, I, I wanted yeah. to have that sense of going back in time, like that journey of going back in time. And so I guess 
we're not going to give away the secret here, but if you haven't yeah, been yeah. there before, it's quite, it, especially for Toronto, it's a unique environment. Yes, yes, it's unique, super, super cool. I've been there I, when I was living in Toronto. I'm in Miami now, but when I was in Toronto, like it, it was definitely one of my go-to spots and yeah, just such a cool spot again. Hey, Ansel, I yeah. didn't realize you were in Miami now. Yeah, I live in Miami. <laughs> really? Whereabouts? Yeah. yeah, I'm in Miami Shores, so it's like uh, pretty central. I'm like maybe like height wise like near ball harbor as a, as a, as a okay point okay because i'm i'm uh uh my wife and i one of the things we did with all the money when yeah. we sold the company is we bought a place in miami but oh, beautiful we've been going through renovations for the last two years it's in south beach um, okay nice yeah it's so like we're down there all the time we're, okay we perfect now no, yeah no. now we 100 percent. when are you coming next or when are you thinking of coming um, next Probably in three weeks to yell at our contractor for not <laughs> done in time. Amazing. For, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get together, dinner, okay. drinks. I love that. Cool. We'll have to try to find, I'll try to, I won't be as cool as your bar in Toronto, but I'll try to think of some cool bars we can go to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to check some yeah. cool places. Have you got yeah. customers down there? Yeah. 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 We're doing well in Miami. Yeah. Miami's been cool. Uh, very receptive. Like there's certain cities that, that like are just like Toronto was great too. Being in Toronto, we got a lot of like the cool restaurants and bars and like, you know, the ones that people know and. Miami, you know, it started off slow, but now it's been like, yeah, we got a lot of the good, cool names down here, which is, uh, which is awesome. Fantastic. Well, yeah. I mean, I would love to open a place in Miami. Like, I don't think this concept exactly would work there, but um, I'd love hey. to have a place in Miami. Yeah. Let's talk about it. I'd love to be interested, uh, involved <laughs> somehow or some way in that. Like, yeah, Miami is an interesting scene. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a hit or miss, but I guess every city kind of has that hit or miss. But yeah. Miami does have a lot of potential and it's nice that, you know, good weather year round kind of thing uh, helps. I mean, summer is quite hot, but like apart from that, it's that's yeah. like 10, month, 10 months a year. Of pretty good. Yeah. weather, I'd say that's awesome. man. It, it's so funny because, you know, you, you're, you're talking about how you convinced, you know, Stephen here. I'm thinking like, St you know, Stephen would have been trying to convince, you know, the investor. But it's amazing that like you just had this idea and you went for it. Um, I love that like you you're able to just have a vision and be like hey i want to do this really kind of you know crazy idea like it, it's not something typ yeah. typically you'll find in people and you know sp speaking of which i think one of the things that you're doing slash did and we spoke about it a while back but i'd love to kind of catch up is um you, me you mentioned it like microdosing and mm -hmm. you know psychedelics and i'd love to pick your brain a bit about that because i know it's probably helped in many ways, whether it's business, relationship. So, you know, if if you can, I don't know if we can chat about it, but I'd love to maybe understand like what got oh, yeah. you into that. And then like, I don't know enough about it. So I'd love to like just learn a bit right now. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. So on that beach, when Stephen and I met in Thailand, we had gone yeah. there for the full moon party. We didn't know each uh, other. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. A mutual friend of ours, Raj, had, had brought a bunch of people together. And uh, that was the first time I had mushrooms. Stephen walked me up to this uh, place called the Shroom Shack. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and um, and we came down with these chocolate shakes. And they just tasted like chocolate shakes. And, and he then, didn't tell you. He didn't tell he didn't you. Tell he was like, and, here's a chocolate shake. And we had the most magical evening. The entire group, there was like eight of us. We were on the beach and, you know, laughing and playing. And, and of course, realized that there was something in the shakes. <laughs> um, and my reaction was along the lines of, I don't understand how I'm, I'm like that was, I was, I think I was 52 or something at the time. Um, but it's like, how is it that I managed to get to 50 years old and I've never had this experience? This is beautiful. This is amazing. Wow. And then shortly after that, at a conference, I met Robin Carhart Harris, who's one of the lead psilocybin researchers in the world in the area of mental health with um, okay. psychedelics. And uh, ended up creating a foundation to help fund his research into this oh, space. Wow. You know, I have a history of bipolar disorder. There's other um, issues. My my daughter at times has struggled with an eating disorder, and I thought that you know there's so much potential in psychedelics if we can sh demonstrate their efficacy. Mm. I mean, that was six years ago, and there is no question now that these things work to help humans flourish. If you're if you have some kind of a disorder, I'm convinced now. There's no such thing as an actual diagnosis. You know, everybody suffers from childhood trauma or adult trauma. And the way we choose to cope with that, our bodies decide to cope with it. It's always in an attempt to do better. Mm. But sometimes we, we use strategies that help in the moment, but don't help later in life. Mm. And uh, like, if you wall, like for me, when I was a ch young child, I walled myself off emotionally from a, a tense environment that was around me. 
And it took me you know, 40 years to realize that and to bring down those emotional walls to help me connect better with oh, people wow. around me. And that was a result of psychedelics. Wow. Um, so, you know, I've experimented with microdosing. I don't think it really works uh, for me. Uh, but the data, scientific data so far says that if you take, I don't know, like a quarter gram or something of, of psilocybin uh, uh, every second day or so, uh, it can alleviate depression if you believe it does. So it's a really, really powerful placebo effect that, but placebo effect is also real. Nice. Um, when you go to the macro doses, five grams or, or, you know, some of the other drugs, like my favorite drug at this point, my favorite psychedelic is called 5-MeO-DMT and that's the uh, toad venom, right? Smoking the toad or licking the toad. Mike Tyson talks about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was terrified to try that one. It's, uh, it's unregulated in Canada, so you can actually okay. get it above ground. Um, uh, without violating any rules and i canceled my appointment with a with a shaman uh twice and so it took a year to finally get around and she was like are you serious this time are you actually going to come in it's like yes i'm actually going to come in how, how soon were you canceled like were you canceling the, the day before or like a few weeks before you were no like, no it was a few weeks before we, okay. it was never in the moment it was like it was just the anxiety would build and build and build uh, and now no. i look back on it and you know and 5-meo dmt is not a drug to be taken lightly like you need to make sure that the person who's giving it to you or sitting with you knows what they're doing. Mm. It only lasts 15 minutes, but it is a wild, wild ride. Um, and it can, it can look like a terrifying experience to somebody who's watching. My wife and I nice. did it together uh, later. She said that if I had gone first, she would never have gone to, to watch me. And meanwhile, I'm flailing around going, oh. <laughs> and in, on the inside of my head, I was like, this is so beautiful. This is so blissful. This is amazing, right? I opened my eyes and they showed me a video of what I had done. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. That's too good. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> but I felt so much better. And it's, it's been that experience along with some deep dives with psilocybin have really, really opened me up emotionally, understanding the relationship between my body and my mind, the somatic awareness that's allowed me to get into deeper forms of therapy. And um, internal family systems is the type of therapy that I've started about a year ago, uh, that heavily relies on being aware of your emotions in your body. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I highly recommend psychedelics for everybody, whether you've got a psychiatric diagnosis or whether you just want to explore and, mm. you know, flourish as a human. Yeah. Uh, tremendous potential. That's, that's super interesting. And like, just to kind of paint the picture, because I've never been to like, um, uh, a place you know that's administered it let's say how do, can you maybe walk through like how does it work you just kind of make an appointment like i'd love to just kind of understand just i'm trying to paint the picture of like the actual experience yeah, so like, example you and your wife like what yeah, happens okay. yeah. so there, there's a place in um uh in british columbia called yeah. enfold institute okay so enfold.org um you can go to their site communicate with them it's um it's for small groups or for private uh retreats you know, I think they can take up to four people now. They're expanding to eight um, early next year. And you show up. So you book an appointment. They'll do a video interview with you to prep you and make sure that you're suitable for the treatment. When you arrive there, you come and you stay on the property. Um, they make all the meals. And then, you know, you do some meditation, some breath work, um, a sound bath where you're lying and meditating and they'll play crystals and musical instruments around oh. you. And all of this can be very emotional and, and, yeah, yeah. and release um, some significant feelings. Uh, and then on the day of everybody's wearing all white and you lie down on a, on a couch and you get a little vape pen and you breathe in for, you know, 10 seconds and then you hold it and they start counting down from 10. And when you get to five, you're gone. Right? <laughs> the world, the world has gone white and, you either become God or you merge with God or, and oh, then, yeah. then you open your eyes and it's 15 minutes later and it feels like a lifetime. And, and it's like, everybody just has this sweet smile on their face and tears in their eyes. And it's like, oh my God, I feel so much better. Right. And you don't really even have it, quite often. You don't have any kind of a narrative to go with it about why you feel mm. better because it shuts down the narrative part of your brain. Mm. Um, and, and most retreats are like, so this one's an overnight one. Um, where right. you spend multiple nights there. Uh, but even in Toronto, if you get introduced through somebody you know with a, with a reputable uh, practitioner, yeah, you just go and meet them at their home or meet at a, at a, a, at a site that they've arranged. Yeah. 
you know, everybody always does prep work prior. You arrive knowing what you're getting into. You have right. your six or eight hour session for with psilocybin or two hour session with, with DMT. And then, um, and then they'll always do a follow up as well to make sure you're okay afterwards. Wow. It's, That's and then super that follow up call yeah, is the most, most important part, actually. Make sure that whatever you realize during your trip, you actually do something about it. Mm, key, right? That's a key yeah. part. And, and so it sounds like and that trip to Thailand and that first experience with that chocolate shake was maybe the precursor to getting into this because what you're doing now sounds pretty amazing. Uh, the, and again, the name of just a shout out, the name of the foundation you're supporting is the uh, Nikian. How do you pronounce yeah, it? Nikian Foundation. Na Nikian Foundation. That's awesome. And it's, it's basically um, an attempt or, att or it's helping, I should say, uh, ideally anyone, but you're also people that might have any type of mental health issues that are looking to improve in one way or another, which pretty much is everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a substantial portion of our funding went to uh, UHM, which is Toronto General, Toronto Western, okay. um, to create a, a psychedelic psychotherapy center. Very and cool. their first research project is going to be um, end of life anxiety. So treating oh, people wow. who've been diagnosed um, with terminal cancer wow. and treating them to, to allow their final months or years to be, um, you know, less anxiety mm. and there's a lot of excitement around that. There's there's plenty of evidence that's now super, that, it, that it helps. Yeah. Wow, I got goosebumps when he said that. That's super, uh, super, yeah, inspiring. Uh, to say the least. Wow. Well, look, hear, hearing that, I mean, one you know, one thing I have to ask is, you know, you you dabbled in many things, right? Your your, your ventures, um, uh, champagne, <laughs> champagne, oysters, coffee. Um, also, I believe you're. Is, are you still involved with uh, Marked? Yeah, uh, yep. amazing. So you know, another restaurant there, right? Like, uh, so between your your, your ventures, the, the the psychedelics, right? You're you're dabbling in quite a few things. I I need to ask for people listening, how do you manage your time, and you know, give yourself this kind of I hate to use the word, but work life balance. Let's call it. <laughs> um, so, uh, really, mo most of the things I've done, I've I've done in partnership with other people. So, for example, mm. the, the coffee oyster champagne and marked Stephen really runs those. Cool. Um, and uh, I, I interject my, my opinions once in a while, but, and okay. he's a good sport about it, but, but he's the operating guy. Yeah. Um, with the foundation, uh, I worked with, uh, you know, Linda Medeiros was, uh, my colleague was um, my co-director of that foundation. Uh, and so, so she, she kept us, you know, disciplined and, and operationally uh, doing the right things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, venture capital doesn't take up a lot of time. Honestly, I'm, I'm not that busy, Angelo, like, other than um, there's so many things I'm interested in. And these days, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot of travel. I was in Ibiza two weeks ago. I'm going to Las Vegas tomorrow to go see you two at the Sphere. Oh, um, so again, cool. you know, not looking for sympathy. I have you know, <laughs> too much travel. <laughs> but, uh, um, that's but, uh, awesome. Man. Good for it's, you. And nowadays, what I spend my time doing is writing, and that's something that can, you know, it fills in, it comes, it fills in the cracks between. Uh, you know, speak. Things. That's awesome, by the way. And uh, yeah, you're not getting any sympathy from me because uh, your life sounds great. No, but honestly, good for you. I, it's always, ha I'm happy when I, when I see other people just doing well and and, and being happy, uh, which is more rare than you would think. Like I thought that was just normal human nature, but not all people are like that. Um, but I need to ask you for people listening, where can they find uh, your writing stuff? Because I've had the chance to see some on LinkedIn, but maybe a quick shout out on where they can follow you. Yeah, please. I mean, if you follow yeah. me on LinkedIn, you'll probably see, uh, see my posts. But um, I have a website, Sanjay says dot co. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you go there, you can sign up for a newsletter or read any of the stuff. You can read about the time Drake came into my bar and I made an ass of myself. Um, <laughs> read about awesome. how I bought a Lucid and kept it for all of three months before going back to my old Tesla. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the point of the, of the of these posts is that having a successful company did not stop me from making some really dumb ass mistakes. Mm. And they continue to the, you know, every day. So uh, I, I love that. I read the, that's awesome. So, so uh, you guys heard it there where you can find it on his website. And yeah, I, I just read the one, uh, it was a little teaser for people. I don't want to butcher it, but you lost, I want to say close to 5 million. Am I, am I, yeah. Uh, yeah so that, that, yeah. that was a, that was a good story if you want to read that one. So yeah, that, it, there's, I really like the writing style too. So highly recommend that. And, you know, I know we're, I know we're, we're wrapping up on time. So I'd love to maybe just end off with, you know, I guess two quick things. One is just, I always like to get um, someone who's lived it ups and downs, the entrepreneurial journey, any words of wisdom or like advice to entrepreneurs listening? No, the words of wisdom would be, you know, 
don't think it's going to be an easy road. When you build uh, your company, and Angel, you've experienced this, right? There's yeah. going to be some very lonely moments. Make right. sure you've mm -hmm. got a, a, a crew, a tight group of people that you listen to mm. who can tell you, you know, get, be away from the, the emotion of it and give you good, mm. solid advice. I have, I'll, in the last 15 years, I've always had a few people like that in my life. Make sure that, that you have them, whether it's your partner or if it's just key people in your social environment. That's awesome. And to wrap up, any what's next for Sanjay? It sounds like writing is going to be a venture you're kind of getting into. Anything else? What's next for Sanjay? Well, I think I'm hoping that coming out of this, I start to develop a thesis around a, a core group of ideas on on life, the universe, and everything. And uh, maybe write another book. Go, go start doing some public speaking. I've always really enjoyed writing and speaking. And that's awesome. But I've never focused on making it a career, largely because I'm afraid to. I was afraid I'd flop if I did it. So mm. it's time. It's time. That's awesome, man. Well, you heard it here first. Sanjay, thank you for joining us on the Anything and Everything podcast. And once again, for people who want to find you, sanjaysays.co. .co, yeah. Beautiful. And Sanjay, for people listening, S A N J A Y. All right. Amazing. Thanks, Angela. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity. This was a lot of fun. This was fun. Thanks for being here, Sanjay. Mm -hmm.